I'm gonna a round of applause for those kids. So it is my honor to introduce the moderators for this event, Fox 61's Jen Bernstein, and the Harper Current's Chris Keating. Thank you very much, enjoy tonight. Thank you, JR. Welcome, everyone. All right, we're gonna start off by introducing the candidates and bringing them on stage. We do wanna start right now with Stanford Chief Financial Officer, Mike Handler. Uh, next, next is this one? Mm -hmm. next, is, next is State Representative Prasad Srinivasan. <laughs> Former U.S. Comptroller General David Walker of Bridgeport. Attorney Peter Lumage of Fairfield. Westport Technology Entrepreneur Steve Obsidnik. And Trumbull First Selectman Tim Herbst. Just a few rules to go over. If you guys can just, uh, moving forward, hold your applause and so that we can get through the time frame, that would be great. Gentlemen, you have all read the rules, and uh, let's all have a great debate. Uh, yes, and we also wanted to say that uh, the arrangements for the debate uh, were made by the Connecticut Republican Party, which decided on the time and the date and the place uh, that you were here tonight. Uh, and we did not choose the timekeepers, but we know they're going to do a very good job. Uh, but we also wanted to know that no one has had any input on any of the questions uh, which were decided by Jen and me. 
that might be obvious, but uh, we just wanted to state that for the record. Uh, and so I think we're ready to begin. Um, oh, they have the opening statements first. Everyone gets correct. one minute. And we're going to be keeping time over here. And those have been agreed to. Uh, the opening statements are one minute, and then there will be closing statements. On the opening statements, we're going to start this way um, as you look at the stage, and the closing statements will start coming back, meaning that Tim Herbst will be first on the closing statements. So Mike Handler's going to start, and your time starts now. Thank you. Good evening. And thank you to everyone who helped make tonight's debate possible. Most importantly, thank you to my lovely wife, Sarah, for all of your loving support. We're all here for one reason. Our state is on fiscal life support. Our jobs and our home values are at risk. My name is Mike Handler, and I'm the only candidate with the relevant public and private sector experience to solve our fiscal crisis. Our problems are complicated, and I can tell you that I have the confidence that our problems are fixable because I've just fixed the exact same problems in the city of Stanford for the past five and a half years. The same problems created by the exact same team that's up in Hartford today. I look forward to a spirited debate. I look forward to talking about real solutions. I thank each and every one of you for coming out this evening. Thank you. Uh, Representative Srinivasan is next. I stop the time. That should, sounds like, sounds like you might have to hold it a little closer. Nice. Go ahead and try. Go ahead. Good evening, everyone. Is that better? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. I want to begin where it all began for me. In 1975, I arrived at Kennedy Airport first-generation immigrant, $7.50 here in my pocket. My mission is to revive Connecticut and make it prosperous again. And my vision is that each and every one of us have an opportunity to succeed. Thank you, to Representative. To me, it is a calling, it's a privilege to be here with you this evening. Thank you. Next up, we have former U.S. Comptroller General David Walker. Thank you very much to the sponsor of this evening and for all of you for showing up. Thank you for my wife, Mary, who got, we got married in college for supporting me in this effort. I'm Dave Walker. I live in Bridgeport, Connecticut. My wife and I chose Connecticut eight years ago, but in the eight years that we've lived here, our home value has gone down 35%. Our property taxes have gone up 55% due to failed leadership at the state and local level, and they haven't even started treating the disease yet. I have over 40 years of proven leadership experience in the public, private, not-for-profit sector. I'm a Reagan, Bush 41, and Clinton presidential appointee. I have made government organizations smaller, more economical, more efficient, more effective, more respected. I've done it before. I can do it again before it's too late. Thank you. Next is uh, Attorney Peter Lamage of Fairfield. Well, good evening. I didn't even know that we had so many Republicans in our state, so thank you very much for being here. Um, I just want to introduce myself to you very briefly. My name is Peter Lamage. Um, I, I want to thank my wife for being here tonight. Um, we have three teenagers at home, so I know the mess that we're going to find in when we go back home. But uh, I came to the United States about 29 years ago as a refugee. My brothers and I escaped communist Albania to search for freedom and opportunity. We found it here. We found it in the United States. We found it in the state of Connecticut. Eventually, after I came over here, I was able to go to college, went to law school, became an attorney from a refugee who had nothing when he came to the United States. Today, I'm creating jobs for other Americans. The reason why I decided to run, I waited and waited for a while for a true Republican to get involved in this election. We have yet to see one. Be proud that you are Republicans. Stand by your principles. Fight for those principles because Peter Lomage will promise you tonight. Thank I'm you, a true Peter. Republican. 
I'm a conservative and I'm proud of it. Thank you very much for being here. Next up, we have Westport Steve Obsidnik. Microphone, I think. Test? Yes, there we go. Time oh, starts now. If the red light's on, you speak. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. Since I graduated from Stanford High over 30 years ago, career politicians have taken us down a road to ruin. Fewer people, fewer jobs, zero economic growth, the loss of GE and Aetna. And what do we have in return? Mounting deficits and debts. My path will be different. I grew up in this state. I attended the U.S. Naval Academy. I came back to Windsor Locks to do my nuclear engineering training. I went down to sub-school in Groton, and I spent a good portion of my life chasing Russian submarines under the polar ice cap. After that, I received a business degree from the Wharton Business School, and then went out to the Silicon Valley, and I was fortunate to have created hundreds of good, high-paying technical jobs. When you go home later, and you pause your TV, you order a movie on demand, or you talk to that woman's Siri on your iPhone, you're using technology I had a hand in creating. Why don't we have jobs like that in Connecticut? We have the people, infrastructure, and schools. We don't have the political leadership. I'm excited tonight to talk to you about how we restore fiscal security to Connecticut and how we create, once again, vibrant industry-led ecosystems to reinvent Connecticut. Thank you very much. Next is Tim Herbst of Trumbull. Good evening, Chris. Good evening, Jen. It's an honor to be here this evening. Um, good evening to all of you. Everywhere I travel in the state of Connecticut, people understand that we're in fiscal crisis, but they're also losing confidence in their state government. And they're losing confidence in their state government because for the last 40 years, one party rule and Hartford insiders have placed the next election ahead of the next generation. We need to stop electing politicians that are focused on the next election, and we need to start electing a new generation of leadership that is focused on the next generation. We need proven reformers and Hartford outsiders to go up to Hartford to clean up the mess under the gold dome. And that's what I intend to do because that's what I've done in Trumbull, working with amazing people. Eight balanced budgets, two tax cuts, a commercial economy that's grown 64.5%, pension reform that has led to an upgraded credit rating, and a school system that has earned national recognition. It's been a team effort. If we have mayors and first selectmen that can do it at the local level, we can do it at the state level. Thank you, But if Mr. we're going to change Hartford, we need to change the people we send there. Thank you. All right. We're ready to start our questions. Yeah, for the questions, we're going to, at least at the beginning, uh, everybody and the candidates know the rules. Everybody's going to get to answer every question, essentially. Uh, and the candidates know they have a certain amount of time. Uh, et cetera, et cetera, and um, we're not necessarily going to cut them off. They have a certain amount of time that they can use up. Um, so we're going we're to start, and we're going to go around this way. So the first question is going to go to Mr. Handler, uh, and it has to do with taxes. Um, uh, candidate Bob Stefanovsky uh, came out this week. He's not here tonight. He said that if he was elected, he would eliminate the state income tax over eight years. That has been promised in the past by other candidates, and it's never happened. Since the income tax raises $9 billion a year, do you favor eliminating the income tax? And tell us, if you do, tell us how that could be done. OK, so the first thing is to acknowledge what the problem is that we're facing as a state. We have a spending problem, not a revenue problem. The revenue problem that we're experiencing is simply a symptom of not addressing our expense problem. So the first order of business must be to control our expenses. Let's talk about where the expenses lie. One third of our budget is fixed structural costs. These are fixed structural costs that contain pensions for employees, defined, benefit, uh, defined pension plans, uh, retiree health care, and debt service. That third of our budget is growing like this. The first order of business we must do before we talk about taxes and revenue is to bend that curve back down. I suspect we have more than enough revenue in our state to handle our budget if we can trim the expense side of our budget first. Anybody suggest to you that we can actually eliminate the income tax right at the top is not telling you the truth. It's nine and a half billion dollars of our, of our state budget. In 1992, a year after the first income tax was put in place, we had a spending cap that passed with 80% referendum. 
but it was never implemented. As governor, I will follow the spending cap, a true spending cap, including debt service and all of our long-term obligations. We must control our costs. Thank you. Does anybody want to answer that question? We're going to go down the line. Two candidates, one is exploratory and one is in candidate for the Republican nomination, have called for eliminating the income tax. Look, I'm for low taxes, but that does not pass the straight face test. It is straight pandering. It is populism. We have to recognize reality that spending is the problem. Spending is out of control. We've already proved the Laffer curve, namely that when you raise taxes to a certain point, revenues actually go down. And that's where we are in Connecticut, and they're continuing to go down. So we've got to get control of spending. But the first thing we need to do is we need to keep businesses and we need to keep uh, high-income individuals from moving out of the state who disproportionately contribute to revenue, to jobs, and to philanthropy. And to do that, we have to eliminate the estate tax and the gift tax. We have to eliminate the 20% surcharge on, corporation, on corporations. We have to move away from the unitary tax system. And then we need, need to provide broader tax relief over time, but we can't do it until we dramatically restructure compensation and benefit programs, until we rationalize our welfare system, and only after that. You don't have to eliminate the income tax, but you have to lower the rates to where we are more attractive as compared to other states in this region. We can do that, but spending's got to get under control. It's out of control. Go ahead. Who here thinks the taxes are too low in Connecticut? Okay? Taxes have to come down. I tell you, the first thing you have to do is we have to hug our customers who still stay here. We can do targeted tax cuts day one. Day two, we have to reduce the size of our state employee funding by 20%. Do you realize that the size of our state employee workforce is 21% larger per capita than the state of New York? And we pay them on average about $7,500 more? Our jobs project for 30 years has been growing government, and it doesn't work. After we do that, then we can talk about across-the-board tax reform, because it costs too much to live here, too much to build a business here, too much to retire here, and that's what I want to address for you all. Go ahead, Tim. Every person should be in favor of eliminating the income tax. However, people need to be honest about what it's going to take to get to that point. We have a massive unfunded liability problem in the state of Connecticut. We have the second most underfunded pension system in the nation. We have a $20 billion unfunded OPEB liability in this state, post-retirement benefits. And unfunded liability is code language for future tax increases. There's a reason why we were the last state in the nation to adopt the budget, and there's a reason why local school funding was decimated and programs that impact people were decimated because the unfunded liabilities are consuming more and more of our budget. We have to get our pension costs under control. We should not be giving out health care that is better than what members of Congress receive, and we know that because we have people in Congress that take the benefits from the state of Connecticut because they're more generous and rich. We need serious, comprehensive pension reform like other states have pursued. And once we get our unfunded liabilities under control, then we can talk about reducing the income tax, eliminating the estate tax, which I agree with, reducing the corporate rates to show businesses we aren't crazy here, eliminating the social security tax, doing the kinds of targeted tax relief that's necessary to give people in Connecticut who need the relief most the relief that they require. But that is not going to happen until we stop telling people what they want to hear and start telling people what they need to hear by getting these unfunded liabilities under control. We have to stop saying what's politically correct. We need to start telling it like it is. Thank you. Um, I'm not going to tell you what the problem is because every one of you knows what the problem is with our state. It is the career politicians, professional politicians, who have taken you and I into this mess. And I don't think we should trust them again. We trusted them once, twice, and they created the mess that we're in. Here's the solution. It's very simple. I think we have to spur growth. Without spurring growth, we're not going to be able to get out of this mess. Lower the taxes. Start by repealing state income tax for any family 
who's reporting less than $100,000 a year. They shouldn't pay any state income tax immediately. Lower the sales tax, lower corporate taxes. We don't have problems with revenue in our state. We have problems with spending. What Hartford has done has to be dismantled. The mentality in Hartford is all about taxes. Can we have more money? From 1992 to present, when we passed the state income tax, our state has collected $192 billion from you and I. Yet we are $62 billion in debt. The question is, where did the money go? They spend it, career politicians, with their pet projects and rent seeking. The mentality in Hartford has to be dismantled. You need a conservative who is fearless, who has the character and the fortitude to go there, not as a politician, as a complete outsider, and get the job done. And I promise you that I'm going to be one of them. Thank you. Go ahead, sir. Eliminating the income tax. Of course, we all want that. Saying no to eliminating income tax is like saying no to motherhood or apple pie. It doesn't go that way. But we've got to do it the right way. We have to do it in a logical, responsible way. We talked about our state having a revenue problem or a spending problem. We said it is a spending problem. I think it's both a revenue as well as a spending problem. Look what's happening to businesses leaving our state. People leaving our state, that's where our revenue issues are. Again and again, we are told our revenues are not in, are not in alignment with what we expected, and we are back into mitigation again. And sure enough, we're going to do this in this session as well. We've got to do logical steps, constitutional spending cap. We had agreed upon that when we said we were going to have the income tax. But guess what? This legislature does not have, the present leadership does not have the moral authority to do what is right. We need a total, complete, constitutional spending cap. We need to be sure we are within our bonding limits, which we never are. We always are thrilled we are under, but we can't afford to bond anymore and kick that can further down. Our pension obligations are out of line. We have got to restructure. We have to learn how we can tighten the belt and make our state prosperous again logically, step by step. Eventually, I hope, the day will come like it did when I moved to Connecticut in 1980. There was no tax, there was no income tax, and guess where we are? And I hope, before I retire, we will be able to say no taxes in Connecticut. But it has to be done logically and in a very systematic manner. Thank you. All right, we're going to move on to our second question now, and Representative Srinivasan, you are first, actually. This has to do with the state budget. Everyone talks about cutting spending, but can you give us specifically three agencies that you would cut as governor? And again, please be specific. Thank you, Jen, for that question. It is, your question was agencies that we would cut. I think the answer rather than agencies that we cut, our agencies have to be run efficiently. And that's not just three. Each and every agency has to be done and run in an efficient way. We just saw, we just heard the horrors that are happening in Whiting Forensic. We have heard the physical torture You've heard the physical abuse. And look at all the financial crisis that is happening there under the watch of CVH and Whiting Forensic. That is an example where I would say we need to make sure those agencies are run efficiently. As ranking member in public health, we have requested 
and we demanded that, that we have a public hearing to hear about the financial atrocities and the first step has happened and hopefully we will continue addressing those issues. Look at our pension obligations. What goes into the pension contributions? What goes into the pension calculations have to be revisited. We cannot afford that anymore where people just stack up in the last few years of their service excess amount of income and all that goes into the pension calculation. One of the things I would definitely look into as a governor is capping the pension benefits. I've heard again and again individuals who make in the ballpark of about $60,000 to $80,000 on an annual basis. They take home pay at the end of the day with overtime. Mandated overtime is a quarter million dollars. And that quarter million dollars goes into the pension calculations. So the inefficiencies that we have rampant agency after agency after agency is what I would go after, not just three, but each and every one of them. Thank you. Why don't we go, I just want to make sure, let's go in order. Next person over. Yep, go ahead. Thank you. It's not just a matter of which agencies you cut. It's a matter of what things are being done right now by the government that ought to be done by the private sector and the not-for-profit sector. And I have a proven track record of making government smaller, more economical, more efficient, and more effective. And let me give you a, con let me give you a concrete example. When I was Comptroller General of the United States under Clinton and Bush 43 for 10 years, uh, I had the responsibility to be Chief Executive Officer of the Government Accountability Office, which oversaw the entire federal government, uh, everything it did anywhere in the world. And we had to lead by example to improving the economy and efficiency and effectiveness of that agency. Through a systematic review, we, may, we reduced the number of organizational units by 60%. We reduced the number of offices by a third. We reduced the headcount by 13%. We increased productivity 50 to 100%. We increased uh, return on investment for the American taxpayers. We tripled it. For every dollar the American taxpayer invested in us, we returned 110. During the 10 years that I was Comptroller General of the United States, we saved the American taxpayers $300 billion plus. The process that I employed to do that is directly transferable and scalable to the state of Connecticut. It's grown too big, promised too much, needs to restructure. Career politicians got us where we are. They're not going to lead us to the promised land. And the people that do not have direct, significant government transformation and restructuring experience, and that's not reform, that's lightweight little league. I'm talking about serious government transformation reform experience will not save our sinking ship of state. The USS Connecticut is sinking. This may be our last chance to create a better future. Thank you. Mr. Lumage. Um, um, the question is, can we downsize the state agencies or which one of them we're going to get uh, rid of? Every state agency should be audited and each and every one of them should be downsized 14%. Every elected official staff and the amount of money that they get for the budget is going to be cut 10%. That will save you and I $1.3 billion a year. Just think about that. They have too much money in Hartford. Money is not a problem over there. It is spending. The scope and reach of government, it is the problem. And I'll promise you I'll reverse that. Thank you. Well, the first office I would change would be governor. I think Dan Malloy's time is up. Look, I have built software systems at the federal, state, and local level. I've reformed Department of Motor Vehicles departments across the country, tax revenue systems. I've worked with the CIA and NSA developing software systems. There's something out there called the internet. 
And the state of Connecticut has to learn how to use it to deliver better quality services at a lower price point. I've done that my entire business career, and it doesn't, just doesn't happen by sitting in a corner office or having career politicians blowing more hot air when you have to go like I did with my father-in-law, who I love dearly, but spent four hours at the DMV with him a few months ago re-registering a car. That needs to happen in 10 to 15 minutes at worst. I built systems like that is possible, but it takes strong leadership, people understand where the world is going, how everyone else is competing out there, and not just having another career politician sitting in Hartford telling us what we know isn't the truth. Thank you. To get to the heart of your question, when I'm your governor, I'm going to go to work on day one completely dismantling the Connecticut Department of Motor Vehicles as we know it. That's number one. Number two, we're going to take on the bureaucracy in the Department of Transportation, which is stymieing economic growth and stymieing progress. The second floor bureaucracy at the DOT is hampering economic development and the ability of our state to invest in our infrastructure and grow. The proof of that is how the state transportation fund is on the brink of financial collapse, as reported earlier today. There are systems in our state, we have hybrid models where we deliver social services. Some of those social services are delivered by 501c3 not-for-profits, as David mentioned. Others are delivered by the state government. There have been projections that indicate that we could save upwards of $500 million a year by simply allowing those people who do the work for one-third of the cost and do it better, do it all. We have to look at, obviously, the fact that our population continues to go down at the time that our growth in spending and the growth of our state government continues to go up. The regulatory environment in this state hampers the ability to reduce spending. So when we talk about reducing spending, we have to reduce the regulatory environment in our state. I've heard horror stories as I've traveled across the state of Connecticut from business owners, entrepreneurs, those that want to invest in our state and create jobs about years that it has taken to secure permits from the DEP and the DOT. We need to attack the regulatory environment in our state. We need to cut the red tape. We need to eliminate the inefficiency and the redundancy. And here's what I'm committed to doing to do that. If I'm elected governor, I'm going to insist that we appoint an inspector general here in the state of Connecticut. And that person is going to be charged with rooting out waste, fraud, and abuse in every sector of our government, in every agency within our government, in every branch in our government. Not just the executive branch, the judicial branch, and the legislative branch. And as Prashad mentioned, we have got to get the cost of our pensions and health care under control because when you look at the state budget over the last seven years and you look at the percent of the budget that's dedicated to higher education, K-12 education, infrastructure, Medicaid, you look at all those sections of the budget as a percent of our total budget they've declined over the last seven or eight years as the unfunded liabilities continue to grow more and more. That's what it's going to take to fix this. I'm proud that in Trumbull, the employee headcount is lower now than I, when I took office eight years ago. It is at a 15-year low, and we did that by transforming government but improving services. That's what we can do for Connecticut. We can transform government, make it smaller, make it smarter, and improve the services that directly impact the lives of people. But it's not going to happen if we send the same people back to Hartford to sit in different chairs. We need proven reformers and Hartford outsiders that are going to tell it like it is to get the job done. The reality is every town in Connecticut, as well as a state, operates businesses that it should no longer be in. When I got to the city of Stanford, I found a failed nursing home. The city of Stanford was one of three municipalities who operated a nursing home. The other two municipalities in the Northeast, anyone guess? Greenwich and Nantucket. Stanford's neither Greenwich nor is it Nantucket. We're losing over $5 million a year for a 128-bed facility. I spent two years privatizing the nursing home, and today it is a thriving home to 128 residents with a waiting list to get in. The new operators have put two and a half million dollars into the home, and our 170 employees maintain their employment, which they otherwise surely would have lost. And the taxpayers of Stanford save five and a half million dollars every year. It is doable. Listen, the DMV is an easy target. 
There isn't anybody here that doesn't think the DMV could be run more efficiently. But the reality is, the sad truth is, we're not going to cut a department and fix our fiscal crisis. I've got a better idea. Why don't we get out of the pension business once and for all? Why don't we make our public sector benefits look like all of yours in the private sector? Why don't we take our pensions and cash them out into defined contribution 401k plans right now? Why don't we take our health plans and make them look more like all of yours? High deductible health plans with health savings accounts. The reason why the Smith House, the nursing home in Stanford was losing so much money, because we were paying salaries and benefits that were 55% above the same job in the city of Stanford. That's unsustainable. If we do not tackle our pension problem and our retiree health care problem, nothing else is going to matter, folks. The, uh, the third question starts with Mr. Walker. Um, there has been a lot of publicity over the last year, basically, um, surrounding the departure of General Electric to Boston and uh, Aetna to New York City, even though that might change now that they're being purchased by CVS. Um, what exactly would you do as governor to prevent the departure of headquarters and other major companies like GE? Well, first, I've met with the CEO of GE, I've met with the CEO of Aetna, and I've met with the CEO of a number of other companies that are still in Connecticut that are contemplating leaving Connecticut. And let's talk about a few of the issues they're concerned about. Number one, our corporate tax system is not competitive. I mentioned that before. We have a, a surtax on corporations. We tax on a unitary basis. Secondly, for high net worth individuals, which includes, by the way, CEOs and top executives in companies, it's not just hedge fund people, they can't afford to die here because of our state taxes and we're the only state in the union that has a gift tax. Thirdly, we are the, we are the second most regulated state in the United States. Only California is more regulated. That has a cost to consumers. It has a cost to taxpayers, uh, and we have to deregulate while maintaining essential consumer environmental protections. But we're way overboard there. Uh, in addition to that, they can read financial statements. The simple fact of the matter is this state is broke. It's rated every trust fund but the pension trust fund, and the pension trust fund is only funded at about 25% based upon reasonable assumptions. The retiree health care trust fund is funded at 1% based upon reasonable assumptions. Uh, we've got continuing budget deficits despite two of the largest tax increases in history. We've got $71 billion in unfunded pension and retiree health care obligations, which represent either future tax increases and or future reductions in education, spending, infrastructure spending, social safety net protection, et cetera. The bottom line is we're in terrible shape. And as a result, what we have to do First, we have to make steps to try to keep businesses and corporations here. We need a business-friendly state. We need a partnership between government and business. You can't be anti-business and be pro-job. Businesses create the jobs. The governor can do that, but most of the things that have to be done when you're talking about tax reform, compensation and benefits reform, welfare reform, infrastructure investment, they take legislation. If you don't have the right governor, you're going nowhere. But it's not just the governor. You need a majority of the legislature, both the Senate and the House, that will support an issue-based, action-oriented agenda to turn around this state. I've got this flag on upside down. What does that mean? Connecticut is in distress. We need to recognize that reality. We're sinking. We need to tell the truth, make tough choices, show the way forward to make a turnaround happen and create a better future in this state. Anybody Mr. Lamage, we'll, we'll keep going this way. Mr. Lamage, if you want to go next. Response or a question? Okay, same question. Uh, the same. Uh, in order for us to keep businesses here and to entice other businesses to come here, you're going to have to start with the tax code, which has to be reformed completely. In addition to the tax code, the regulations that are passing, any state agency that passes a regulation should be required to repeal four. That is one of the ways to do it. Mandates that are coming from the state, they are going to have to be repealed, a number of them. Instead of creating an environment for people to invest in our state, we're doing the opposite. We're forcing them to leave. One of the, the, the ways to keep that business in our state, and it wasn't Fairfield where I live actually, and we lost a ton of jobs when they, when they left. It would have been for someone 
from Hartford to sit down and talk to them. It's interesting when you hear elected officials on stage tonight, and some of them being um, long lifetime bureaucrats, tell you that everything that they touched with their hand somehow is a success. If that is the case, how come our state is in such a mess? Each and every one of them is telling you a success story. I worked with this guy, I was elected here, I didn't raise taxes, yet the state is a mess. If that is the case that each and every, each and every one of them succeeded, who got us into this mess? Trust me, it's them. And I don't mean that personally them. I mean elected officials, career politicians, people that we send them for way too long in Hartford and they lost touch with you and I. That's why I think we should have some term limit for these people. Thank you. You know, I'm the only one on this stage that has created jobs, high-tech jobs, out in the Silicon Valley, in Minnesota, in my last business in Rochester, New York. So I've been privileged to work around the state, I mean, around the country. First thing what we have to do is get people to form businesses. Connecticut needs to take a big fat Lipitor. We have too much cholesterol in our system. We have to have a SEAL team of people who get rid of the red tape that get people into business, not keep them out of business. Second of all, Dan Malloy's incentive of the first five program to give tens of millions of dollars to big corporations does not work. I'll give you one tax credit that I'm looking at. If you create a job in the state of Connecticut, you get, let's say, a $10,000 tax credit for the next year for five years. I don't care if you're the Minuteman cleaners in Westport, you're ESPN, it doesn't matter. We need every small, medium, and large business who's committed to Connecticut to get a benefit to stay here, not the big companies. And thirdly, we have to rethink how we create ecosystems. We have to attract applied research universities, have them attract businesses, have them attract millennials, which attract the restaurants and all the other cultural stuff we want. That's what the Silicon Valley is about. That's what Rochester, New York is about. That's what Minneapolis is about. And that's what Connecticut needs to be around industries that we thrive in. Healthcare and life sciences delivery, advanced manufacturing, and finance and insurance. I'll just take one of them, but I'll love to work with you on delivering three of them. Thank you. There's a bigger problem in Connecticut that goes to the root of your question. People that want to grow jobs and businesses in Connecticut don't have confidence in their government. They don't have confidence in the people that we have empowered to make decisions and to move the chains down the field. We're not moving the chains down the field, we're losing yardage. And I have to tell you, it's not only the regulatory environment, it's not only the regressive tax structure in our state that punishes job creators, it's also the people that we are putting in positions of trust that aren't getting the job done. I'm gonna replace Commissioner Smith if I'm elected governor. I think it's a disgrace that when you're going to present uh, something to GE to keep them here, you put the logo of another company on the front of the presentation. That's just sloppiness. It's outrageous. I'm going to replace the commissioner of the Department of Transportation, and I'm certainly going to replace Ben Barnes at OPM, who's been a disaster. The last seven budgets have been consistently in structural deficit. That's a fact. The last seven budgets have used one-time revenues and gimmicks. And that's a problem, because when businesses see that level of unpredictability, they're not going to want to come here, because it's such a volatile environment. There's no stability. There's no predictability. Businesses can't plan for the long term in the future. The other thing that we need to end, and I'm committed to ending if I'm elected governor, is the corporate welfare that this governor and a majority Democratic legislature has impo imposed here in the state of Connecticut. All in total, they've given out $1 billion in corporate welfare. They were going to give millions of dollars to a $27 billion hedge fund to move from one Connecticut community to another. At the same time, they're increasing taxes on small business owners and job creators. That is absolutely misguided. And that billion dollars they spent on corporate welfare, which has proven to be an abject failure, is a billion dollars that we didn't spend investing in our infrastructure. Infrastructure reform is the key to our economic development renaissance in the state of Connecticut. We've got to get back to work investing in our roads, our highways, and our bridges. 
because it's not only a quality of life issue, it's an economic development issue. Businesses aren't going to want to come to our state when their employees are spending three or four hours a day in the car getting to and from work. We not only need to invest in our roads and our bridges, we need to invest in our rail system in Metro North, which is the key to our economic recovery. I'm committed to doing that, and I will appoint a commissioner of economic development, transportation, and a secretary of OPM that will get the job done and get our state's economy moving again. We are an embarrassment nationwide for losing GE and Netna. We have to stop being an embarrassment with 49 other states. We need to start being the role model, and we need to start being the leader. GE leaving was a wake-up call, but it should not have been a surprise to anybody. Our state has been closed for business for a long time. You can't be closed to business and try to throw money at a couple select companies hoping you'll pick the winners particularly when you're not very good at picking the winners. GE, Aetna, Alexion, Starwood, UBS, RBS, we're not very good at picking the winners. There's an embedded opportunity for companies located in lower tax states to take advantage of companies located within the state of Connecticut. And that is synergies. A company that lives or operates out of a low tax environment has an embedded synergy when they acquire a company within Connecticut that has a high tax rate. So we're not, we shouldn't be surprised that CBS is buying Aetna. We shouldn't be surprised that Marriott bought Starwood. But we need to stop being closed for business. Tim's right. We do need to work on our infrastructure. We have to be the only state in the country where rail times are actually increasing over the last 10 years rather than decreasing with technology. How is that possible? Why are companies not coming to Connecticut or growing their businesses? Think about yourselves. When you go to buy a home, what do you need to make that decision, the biggest decision of your life? You need job security. You need to know what your mortgage payments are going to be. And the biggest determining factor in the variability of your mortgage payment is your property taxes right now. Without those two decisions, you can't make that big commitment. Companies come here for a lifetime. They need predictability. They don't plan for one year. They don't plan for a budget cycle. They don't plan for an election cycle. They come here for a long time. They leave their jobs, their you know, homes where they are. They leave their schools, pull their kids out of schools. They sell their homes. And they come and plant you know, in Connecticut for 30 years buy homes, put their kids into schools. They do not know what the next couple years taxes are going to look like. Why? Because we have a spending problem that is out of control. If we do not control our long-term costs, nothing else is going to matter. Here's the good news. Connecticut is a beautiful state. We've got everything going for us. We're not challenged geographically. We're not challenged climately. We don't have tornadoes in Connecticut. We've got a lot of good things going for us, a lot of talented, hardworking people. We've got to lower the cost of doing business, take a look at the 15,000 pages of regulations that we have that are taxing and feeing and fining our small businesses out of existence and start being open for business again. Then you'll see companies coming back to Connecticut and job growth for all of you. Thank you. Business will tell us again and again it is regulations excessive regulations, mandates, excessive mandates that throttle them, do not give them the confidence to keep these lights on and the doors open. That is what we need to address. We do not need to be as regulated and as mandated as we are. We need, businesses need a predictable environment. They need to know What's going to come down the pike, not just today and tomorrow, but for the next six months or the next year? It just shows where we are as a state when our business industry associations, they cringe when the state is in session because they never know what's going to come down the pike. That is the attitude we have to change. How can we encourage businesses to come to Connecticut, to stay in Connecticut, and to grow in Connecticut if we are not able to give them the confidence? Businesses tell us again and again, we do not have adequate workforce. It might come as a surprise to some of you, but it is not. It is reality. So from the school system all the way to a career, we need to make sure we address that we have adequate workforce.
We have talent in our state. It is a beautiful state. I definitely agree with you. It's a gorgeous state, a state I want to live, and a state that I want to retire in. But what do our millennials tell us? That they get educated here, look at Yale, you get Yukon, Quinnipiac now, wonderful, wonderful graduates. But what happens to them after they graduate? How come they leave us and do not stay back in Connecticut? Those are the concerns we have because that's the sum total. Businesses leaving our state, the big names ever mentioned, in their exit conversations, they told us, along with the cost of doing business here, it is the inadequate, talented workforce that they have. We need to address that cost step by step in a logical way. But right away, we need to make sure we have the workforce that our industry requires so they can continue to grow here. That's what I would address when elected as your next governor. Thank you. All right, this next question, Mr. Peter Mlumaj, uh, this starts with you. It has to do with legalization of marijuana. Democratic candidate Dan Drew is calling for the legalization of marijuana, and some in the legislature have said it would raise millions of dollars annually. What is your position on legalization? Uh, gee, how did I know I'm going to get that? Uh, <laughs> look, I don't think we should legalize marijuana for the purposes of raising more money. Uh, the only reason why the Democrats and some Republicans agreed to legalizing it, it has to do with revenue. That shouldn't be the reason. As I said, we do have the revenue. We have problems with spending. Personally, I've never smoked marijuana, and I hope my kids will never smoke it. I don't recommend it to anyone. But if we do that for medical purposes, I wouldn't have any opposition to it. And if the legislative body decides to legalize it, uh, so be it. I wouldn't have any problems with that. That's a personal decision for people as to whether they want to smoke it or not. I wouldn't recommend that to anyone. I wouldn't promote it. Uh, but again, I would oppose it if we do it only for revenue purposes. Because if we do that, then why don't you do gambling also and uh, some other vices should be maybe legalized because you can, can make some money out of it. Uh, so that's where I stand with it. Thank you. Thank you. I went to the U.S. Naval Academy and served in the Navy for five years, so I can't say I was a big user of marijuana. Um, I actually have never used it. However, I have some really good friends who came back scarred from Afghanistan and Iraq. And medical marijuana, they've opened my eyes to how that's alleviated a lot of the post-traumatic stress that they deal with every day. And medical marijuana in Connecticut's legal. There are 20,000 registered users and I think 700 physicians who subscribe. But I think we have to break this into two discussions. People have said it's a revenue generator, but I've heard from the OFA it's about $50 million a year. I actually think there are other ways this state can go about creating other revenue streams that actually retain people here in Connecticut. So I don't think the argument's an economic argument. I think the argument or the discussion is around what culture do we want in our state? And I'm an evidence-based person. I'm a nuclear engineer. I used to split atoms for a living. So I'm open to the dialogue and discussion. I'm not gonna kid around. It's not my Monday morning activity. My, my Monday morning activity is how do we turn the moving vans around? How do we lower the cost of living? How do we fight for your heart and soul to stay in Connecticut as opposed to one of the kids who takes care of my daughter, she's a teacher. And she's saying with the tax on teachers going up, why don't I go to Nashville? That's the person we have to fight for the heart and soul around. But thank you for your time. You know, when I look at the craziness that's going on up in Hartford, I sometimes think that we have a lot of decision makers who are perhaps using a little too much of the product. Um, but, but let me just say, let, let me just say, um, I personally have a problem with it, uh, but I think that we should look at what other states in New England have done. Uh, Governor Baker, personally opposed to it, put it on the ballot, let the voters decide. I think that's something that the state is going to have to discuss, but the bigger concern that I have is twofold. When we start talking about 
legalizing marijuana, implementing tolls, adding additional casinos to our state as a crutch to balance our budget, we have really misaligned priorities because we're talking about revenue enhancements rather than talking about the need to cut spending. And that I have a real problem with. Here's the second problem I have with this discussion about marijuana. And as you know, I disagree with Mayor Drew on an awful lot. Uh, my problem is, at, the t at a time when they're talking about legalizing marijuana, we have an opioid crisis in our state of significant proportion. New England especially has been adversely harmed by this opioid epidemic. I have attended too many wakes and funerals as the chief executive of Trumbull that have been caused by a drug overdose, and I've seen up close what it's done to victims, what it's done to families. And here's my commitment. We're not gonna have a conversation about legalizing marijuana unless and until this state government comes up with a comprehensive plan to attack this opioid epidemic in our state. We need to give law enforcement the tools that they require to do their job. We need to do what Governors Sununu and Hogan of New Hampshire and Maryland have done in declaring a state of emergency with respect to this opioid epidemic. We need to help local school districts and local police take this problem on. We need to hold doctors accountable that overprescribe, and most importantly, we need to hold the pharmaceutical industry accountable for the representations they make with respect to opioids. It's a crisis, it's a problem. We need to take care of our people and deal with this problem before we start talking about legalizing marijuana. And that should be the priority. Anybody who is suggesting that we legalize marijuana has not looked at the long-term effects and how it affects states in particular. Um, I'm also concerned about children. When we're talking about legalizing the recreational use of marijuana, I'm concerned about the impact it will have on our children. Um, I believe we should look at the data, and I suggest the data more than likely is going to suggest that marijuana use does not increase IQs in young people. Um, I do agree with Tim. Um, having served as an EMT for over 20 years, um, I've seen firsthand what happens um, to a community when opiate abuse is rampant. And I do agree that it is an epidemic right now. And we've got to take swift, bold action. And that action has got to include holding doctors accountable for prescribing the appropriate dosages and amounts of medication to patients. It also includes educating and penalizing doctors who do not follow the prescribed dosages and prescribe too much of the medication. We also have to work on one major factor. We must remove the stigma associated with any addiction. Too often, people are suffering in silence, and that's unacceptable. As your governor, I will put in place immediate action, actionable items that we can actually stop our insanity in our communities where this overdose uh, is creating an epidemic. We are losing, anybody know, we've lost more American lives in the last 12 months to opiate overdoses than we have during the entire Vietnam War. That's where we should be spending our time and energy, not on legalizing marijuana at this time. Thank you. Just last week, or maybe 10 days ago, there was a discussion, a debate on legalization of marijuana down at Yale. And a lot of us were there at the, sta at the podium that evening I happen to be the only Republican that showed up for the debate. And you can imagine who all shared the stage with me. And I was very happy and thrilled that opposing as I did constantly, consistently, for almost an hour and a half of that debate, I was not thrown out, I was not booed. Because you know what? Legalization of recreational marijuana is not the right thing to do. We have to look at the public health impact on the developing brain at the age of 25. The brain is still developing. And here you are legalizing a drug, um, something that's going to have a huge impact, societal impact on all of us. Public safety. Can you just imagine the impact of driving under the influence of legalized marijuana and alcohol, the combination of the two. We have no system. We still don't have a way we can measure THC levels. So we don't have that yet, A. B, 
Even if we have THC levels, we don't know impairment. All it gives you is a static number. That does not mean whether you're impaired or not. And you can just imagine if you are impaired under the use of marijuana, and just visualize this. How would you like to come to my practice and get your allergy shot from a nurse who is moving around, a little impaired, and ready to give your injection? Would you want that nurse, he or she, to administer that injection to you impaired under the influence of marijuana? Look at the impact it's going to have on our society. And of course, the criminal component. You don't know how law and order is going to react to that as well. Just the day after we had this intense debate at Yale, the very next day in Colorado, in the state of Colorado, which as you all know has legalized, a county in Colorado is suing the governor for the increased number of fatalities on the road because of legalizing marijuana. We've got to wait. We've got to learn from other states, including Massachusetts, which has approved it as we know, but has not implemented yet, pushed out the date to June of this year. They are also waiting. Let's not rush into something where we do not have enough information on the long-term consequences. And for those who believe it's a revenue windfall, it is not. It's $61 million. That's what the Office of Fiscal Analysis tells us. That's all we're going to get, $61 million. And you can just imagine the societal implications of $61 million. It is definitely not the way to go for us here in Connecticut. For the record, I do not and have not used marijuana. Didn't even put it up to the mouth so it wasn't an issue of inhaling. All right? Uh, look, let, let's, I'm shocked by how many times I get questions about marijuana. Our state's in terrible shape. We're bottom five in financial condition, bottom five in competitive posture, one of the few states in the union that actually have a declining population. And typically when people ask me about where marijuana, why are they asking, we can get more money, more money, more revenue. Now, I don't know that that's really why they want an answer to it, but that's what they say, we can get more revenue. As several of us have said, we got a spending problem in this state. We are addicted to deficits and debt. We are addicted to trying to find out how we can end up taxing something. If it moves, we want to tax it. Look, here's the bottom line. We have medical marijuana right now. My understanding with talking with professionals is our definition of the application of medical marijuana is narrower than it should be. And so we ought to consider whether or not there ought to be a broader definition of legal use of medical marijuana, including for post-traumatic stress disorder, et cetera. Uh, but with regard to the recreational use of marijuana, you've got to answer several questions for me because my, my reaction is no, but there are several questions. Number one, is it a gateway drug? There's conflicting information on that. Number two, can we detect it if you are under the influence when you're driving? That's public safety. And thirdly, with regard to public health and future, future potential obligations of the state, the brain, as has been mentioned by, by Prasad, the brain continues to develop until you're 25 years old. And so even if you were able to answer the first question that no, it's not a gateway drug, and yes, we've got a way to detect if you're driving under the influence, even if you were ever going to legalize it, you probably wouldn't legalize it below the age of 25. Uh, but you're going to have to convince me that those answers can be done in the right way uh, because I think public health and safety trumps a little bit of revenue. Thank you. All right, everyone, we are going to take a five-minute break, and we will resume the debate soon, 7.15. All right, so 
for those that are curious, uh, Senator Tony Boucher, who is an exploratory uh, for governor, uh, she's not an official candidate for governor, but one of the officers she's exploring got stuck in a little traffic, so she was late, but we've added her to the stage, and we're going to give her a one-minute introduction, and she will be included in the second half. So, Senator. You Thank you. Good evening, everyone. It's wonderful to see you. I'm Tony Boucher. I'm a businesswoman. I work for currently an investment firm, institutional, and travel all over the country, in every state, in Detroit as well, meeting with CEOs and heads of large nonprofits and corporations. I also happen to be a state senator and the chief deputy majority leader because we are a part-time, not career politician in Connecticut, we're part-time, so we juggle our multiple lives. And I, as you heard, I am not a declared candidate for a public office. I am exploring and testing the waters for statewide office, including my current state senate seat and possibly a role in the governor's race as well. But that's yet to be determined. You know, people say, why in the heck would anybody ever want to do this? Look at the terrible shape Connecticut is in. Well, I'll tell you why. I came to this country when I was five years old from a little farm in Italy. We immigrated to Naugata, Connecticut. No money, no education, no command of the English language. Thank you, Senator. And that is why I am running, because I want to repay the debt of a great Connecticut. Uh, we're going to continue with the questioning here. Um, and in our order, it, uh, we're starting with Mr. Upsitnik uh, for this. Uh, this is regarding casinos. Uh, the battle over casino expansion in Connecticut is ongoing. Uh, now MGM is interested in building a casino in Bridgeport, as you know. Uh, should Connecticut expand gambling to other entities besides the state's two federally recognized tribes? Well, thank you for the question. I don't believe that the state of Connecticut should be spending its money, like that first five program, to lure casinos here. But I believe that we have a migration problem. We have a jobs problem. And particularly in Bridgeport, where the next proposed casino is, they have a high unemployment problem. I think if a large corporation wants to come invest in Connecticut and bring their money and employ people, it's their right to do it. And we need to do that beyond just industries there, we need to look at how we're going to compete in the 21st century again. Life sciences and healthcare delivery. We have an aging population. We have a healthcare system which costs too much. We need to revolutionize how we deliver healthcare to people. Better quality of service is a lower price point. We need to look at and hug the largest helicopter maker, submarine maker, and jet engine maker in the world and create an ecosystem around them and attract jobs like that. And finance and insurance still remain probably the largest sec sector of our own state GDP. All of these industries haven't moved out yet. And we've got to hug those industries and get anyone who wants to invest here in Connecticut and help it make it easier to do business in Connecticut. So that's my philosophy and what we need to do. Thank you. Just going to go I'll, in order first. I'll keep it very brief. Um, I am not in favor of any casino expansion that compromises existing casino jobs in other parts of the state. And I do not think we can have a conversation about a casino in Bridgeport unless it includes a conversation of how we're going to address traffic congestion in southwestern Connecticut, which was a big reason why the casino proposal in 94 did not go forward. Senator Boucher. I've never been that supportive of casino expansion in Connecticut, but Bridgeport does deserve to really decide on their own which way they want to go with this. We already have $345 million that we get from the casinos currently. I don't know how well we spend that money. Quite frankly, I've listened to the conversations previously, and I agree that what we need to do is really encourage and expand the business sector. We cannot spend our way down. We need to grow our way up in Connecticut. We need to expand the tax base with lower taxes instead of re in decreasing the tax base by increasing taxes as we have it. So the bottom line is we really need to take a look at 
tax policy. For me, that is what drives the state economy. That is what drives businesses in and out. You asked the question previously about GE and others. It's not just GE. I have florist shops these days that say they don't compete with other florists in Connecticut anymore. They're competing with the governor and with this administration to taking money out of people's pockets that they would spend there. What we really need to do is reduce the costs for all businesses, not specific industries. We don't need to increase pot use in the state to get more revenues or taxes that in fact would increase our social services cost by exponential. The bottom line is we have to make it less expensive for all businesses, including payroll taxes, including their tax structure, including the regulations that they are spending on. This is what they tell me that they want. We don't have to increase the expansion of casinos if we really reduce the cost for all businesses in the state. You know, the governor likes to tout the, 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 five, the special five program, the top five, and he's going to give them money to keep them here because it costs too much to stay. So he literally has to bribe these companies to stay, and they're not staying. They'd rather forego the big tax incentives, right, and just get out of the state of Connecticut and go somewhere where it's a lot less expensive to do their business. So the bottom line is we need to take a look at the entire tax policy. You know, all of these gentlemen here all have great ideas. They're good people. We could finish each other's sentences. In fact, we all agree on most of this. But the bottom line at the end of the day, we better take a look at who's exploring or who's a candidate for statewide office that can win in Connecticut. The only way we're going to change this is if we can win those offices and change the leadership that is in this state. There's probably only a, one of us that has proven that they can win, as I've won the most votes of any state senator in the entire state of Connecticut, two elections in the row, primarily by the crossover vote. And at the end of the day, all good plans fall on deaf ears if we can't win. And the public is looking for a different kind of candidate, a candidate that's lived the two lives of Connecticut, the urban poor life, the affluent part of Connecticut that's been there, that's been an immigrant, that had to fight their way up out of poverty through education, hard work, and industry in order to make it go and work well and attain the American dream. That resonates in our inner cities, which we have to win over, at least to some degree. They need someone that's been a business person, created jobs. I've created jobs like the rest of them for GE, for Weston, for the small businesses I've started that understands how business works. Did you know that I've had to actually debate in the Finance Committee that profit is a good thing? When elected representatives don't believe or understand that profit is what makes a business grow and what adds jobs, we've got a serious problem up in Hartford. We really, really do. So knowing how business is run and having been a local Board of Ed um, chairman, having been a um, Board of Selectmen member, negotiating union contracts in each of these areas, State Board of Ed, State Representative for 12 years, and now in the State Senate, all the while working in business, traveling around the country, we have to have someone that understands both. And at the end of the day, through all of this, we need someone that can prove that they can win. So that's going to be the determination when I make a decision to continue this exploratory and finally decide which way to go. And that's something that we should all consider because, as I said, these are all good people with great ideas. We all agree on what those plans should be, all of them. But at the end of the day, we have to win. Um, it looks like tonight everybody who's running for governor or looking into running for governor is either refugee or immigrant. Um, you know, it's interesting. And this is the Republican Party, which is great because we're always accused of not being inclusive enough. But I want to share a, a, a story with you. On the election night in 2016, I stood up with my wife watching the results until late. And at about 3 o'clock in the morning, I got a call from Governor Malloy. And he says, Peter Lumage, it looks like Donald Trump just won. I said, well, it looks like he did. He says, well, I'm as happy as you are. And I said, why would you be happy? You're a Democrat, you're a liberal. He says, because I hope he's going to deport you. Uh, I don't think he's going to do that. Um, I'm here. I haven't been deported. But uh, it's interesting when I hear these professional politicians again, never taking a blame for the failures in our state. And that is a concern that you and I should have. They have been in Hartford for too long. 
when we passed the budget, and it was supposed to be bipartisan budget, the Republicans had Democrats convinced to vote for their own budget, the Republican budget. A couple of months later, instead of convincing more Democrats to move to the right and agree with us, the weak need Republicans agreed with the Democrats and they gave us what they gave us. It's time that we have some common sense, conservative solutions in Hartford. A professional politician, a career politician is not going to do that. They would never harm themselves. You need outsiders. You need someone who understands what it means to work in Burger King, to flip burgers. I did it. You need someone who understands what it means to live in a city, such as the Bronx or Bridgeport. I did it. When my family and I came over here, we were taken in by a Protestant church who helped us learn English and get ourselves up and running. I was able to go to college eventually, and I did it on my own. I was able to go to law school, and I did it on my own. I have a small business, and I do understand what small businesses are going through, because I'm one of them. I get up at 5 o'clock in the morning every single day to go to New York where I practice law. And by 2.30, 3 o'clock in the afternoon, I come back over here to talk to you and others. You're going to make a significant decision in May 2018, and that is nominating the next governor of the state. Exercise that power very carefully, because someone Three kinds of candidates are going to come in front of you. Some people who have been in Hartford for way too long, and I call them career politicians. Some people who have so much money that they don't know what to do with it, and they said, well, let me just run for governor. And you'll have the outsiders, such as me, who want to get the job done. And I hope that that trust that is going to be placed upon you when you go to the convention is going to be exercised properly. Because as Republicans, we've been losing elections for the past three terms. The reason why we lose, we're afraid to be Republicans, we're afraid to be conservatives, we're afraid to be constitutionalists, we're afraid to be what made this nation great. And that shouldn't be the case. I had a chance. Please hold your applause. And Mr. Lamont, just keep in mind that the question is about casinos. I had a chance. <laughs> Casinos are not going to produce the results that we need to get the state out of this mess. We need constitutionalism, we need conservatism, we need dedication, we need the backbone, and we need to sacrifice something for the sake of this state. By taxing you more and by bringing these vices into our state, we're not going to get out of this mess. So let's start reforming what we have over here the tax code, the regulations, the mandates, and make sure that we go to Hartford and clean that place up because it's due to do it. Republicans have a chance to take this in 2018. It is ours to lose it, and we're going to win it unless we do what we did in 2014 and the prior years. Thank you. All right, and, and guys, hold on one second. We're going to try to go in order. I know he jumped up, but we're going to... Oh, yes, go ahead. Sorry, I missed that. He has 20 seconds to rebuttal. Thank you. I want to make sure that's on my rebuttal. Yes. It was just mentioned that in the latest budget, the Democrats and the Republicans came together and voted on that budget. I want to make sure we all are clear on what budget we are talking about. There was a, bu there was a budget that we passed the Republicans passed that was vetoed by the governor. And then there was a budget that was passed, which was, quote unquote, a bipartisan budget. And I did not support that budget. I did not vote for the budget because I know Time. that is not the right direction for our state to go. I want Time. to make I, sure we clear that. I get 20 seconds. He mentioned my name. I get, the, did I get 20 seconds, yes. If you mention my name. The truth is that he's voted more with the Democrats, with the Republicans, check his record. The only time that he voted against the budget 
it was when he decided to run for governor. And that was a calculated move. And you and I should be tired of calculated moves that these politicians are making hurting you and I. That was the only time he voted against the budget. And that shouldn't be the case. If I were there, I would have voted against it. Uh, back to casinos here. We're Mr. continuing Hanlon. with casinos, which is where we started. One more question? Sure. You want the question again? It's been so long, here's the question again. <laughs> it's actually even before the break, only kidding. The battle, here's the question. The battle over casinos. I'm just kidding, I got it, I got it. All right, you got we're it, okay. you're good. We're okay. Moving forward. How about this for a novel concept? I'm in favor of the free market. But here's the catch. You've got a small problem. We are in the casino business. Through failed policy, we are hooked on revenue from casinos right now. How about we get ourselves unhooked from casino revenues? Let's lower our costs. Let's take our budget and actually reduce our structural costs and stop being dependent on one-time revenue streams that are at risk when neighboring states build casinos. I have no problem with the casino. I think Bridgeport has every right, without state assistance, to have a private business build a casino, but I would like to see the state of Connecticut out of that business as fast as possible. Thank you. I actually live in Bridgeport. We have to turn around our state to create a better future, and we have to revitalize our cities, including Bridgeport. The fact is, is that millennials, empty nesters, and businesses want vibrant cities. They don't have to be big cities, but they need to be safe, they need to have things to do, and they have to be a place that people want to be. We have at least four cities in this state headed for bankruptcy, absent a change. We need to promote economic de development in our cities, we need to engage in financial restructuring of our cities, and I am for pursuing the possibility of a privately financed entertainment complex, casino, plus, 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 in Bridgeport. You're not going to solve the state's financial problems with casino revenues. I'm personally not a gambler, but we need more jobs in Bridgeport. If you're going to have a casino in Connecticut, it makes a lot more sense to be in Bridgeport than in other possibilities that people are talking about because of Metro North, because of the ferry, because of a variety of our factors. But I do agree that if we're going to pursue that, it's got to be privately financed, no public money, and we've got to do something with regard to transportation. And by the way, you know, we can kind of look at other parts of the world. Mary and I are fortunate. We've traveled to 100 companies, countries, all 50 states, all eight continents. You know, there's something called high-speed water ferries. There happens to be one between Hong Kong and Macau. Macau is Portuguese, it's an entertainment center and gambling center. Why can't we do the same thing? Not just because there might be gaming in Bridgeport, but to try to help relieve congestion with regard to I-95 and otherwise. Thank you. Hold on. Did he? I know that you didn't talk about casinos, yours was a rebuttal. So you can talk about casinos. Yes. You didn't answer it yet. Right. I'm talking about the casinos now. Casinos. Okay. Thank you. This will be the last comment on casinos. Then we're going to move forward. We call them casinos, but right now they are actually entertainment centers. They are actually places people take vacations and take families as well. So we've got to rethink of what we call as a casino. Number one. But my concern is not about casino expansion. I'm thrilled that Bridgeport is considering that. We need to vitalize our cities, no question about that. But we also need to keep in mind our relationship, the contract we have made with Compaq and the tribes that we will not allow casino expansion in our state because then we will lose the revenue, the $250 million that we get from slot machines. So we just want to keep that in mind before we go into expansion of a casino or an entertainment center. Thank you. All right, we're going to go on to our next question, and this one is for Tim Herbst. It's about guns. 
Did you support the post-Newtown gun control bill, and would you support banning the so-called bump stock device that allowed the shooter in Las Vegas to fire more shots than he otherwise would have? Jen, I support the Second Amendment to the Constitution of the United States. I am a gun owner. I have a permit. I believe in the right of people to, to uh, engage in sporting, and I also believe in the right of law-abiding citizens to defend themselves from harm. I feel very strongly about that. That law did not do enough to address the 800-pound gorilla in the room, which is mental health. We have a mental health crisis in this country. And I know people want to talk about guns, but this governor has depleted funding for mental health and wellness consistently. Dr. Srinivasan talked about the one mental health facility in the state of Connecticut where we had people in that facility that were being abused and there doesn't seem to be any accountability from our state government. We have some of the toughest gun control laws in the country. In point of fact, before 1160, Governor Weicker instituted some of the toughest gun control laws in the country. This is a problem that needs to be confronted by addressing the underlying cause of why people commit acts like this. They're not operating on a full cylinder. When I'm governor, I am not going to punish law-abiding citizens. We're going to punish criminals. We're going to repeal the early prisoner release program under Dan Malloy. We're going to stop decimating the Connecticut State Police like this governor's done every year. And you know what? In my first 100 days as governor, I will send a bill to the legislature reinstituting the death penalty in the state of Connecticut. The bump stock device, though, can you, are you, would you support that, banning that, or no? Senator Boucher asked for... The bump stock device, that was the question. The question was, would you support banning the so-called bump stock device that allowed the shooter in Las Vegas to fire more shots than he otherwise would have? There's questions about that actual device as it relates to Las Vegas. There are still questions about whether or not that was a bump stock, just to be clear. I think it's insignificant to point out that we have some of the toughest gun control laws in the country. And I think that what you're talking about, the Congress of the United States is going to have to take up. I am not in favor of any additional gun control until we start addressing mental health. We have people that kill other people with cars, mow people down, not just guns. We have people that commit violent acts because they're not operating with a full deck of cards. And what happened in Newtown was as much about mental health as anything else. And you know what? I haven't seen the legislature act upon addressing increased funding for mental health, increasing funding for school safety, which they should have done under 1160, and increasing funding for local towns and cities. All right, thank you, Tim. Senator Boucher. Prior to 1160, uh, the state of Connecticut always negotiated with both sides on the gun issue. And I never voted for anything that wasn't a compromise and agreed upon by both sides. When Sandy Hook occurred, they asked me to chair the school safety committee of that committee, not the gun portion of that bill. And we really did uh, put in place some good school reform and changes. As was said, and, and I afterwards also supported any amendment that would make more flexible, including the magazine size for guns from 10 to 17. But at the end of the day, the bill did pass. And at the end of the day, it's not going to do a whole heck of a lot, really, for gun control, in essence, because every weekend they sell guns off the, the back of a, of a trunk of a car that's illegal in many of our inner cities. And so the enforcement, to me, is really the big issue. I don't think we need to go any further. If anything, we need to make the guns laws a little bit more flexible. Thank you. Mr. Handler? So I, too, support the Second Amendment, and I do support law-abiding citizens to have the right to bear arms. Many of you know that I'm the Chief Financial Officer for the City of Stanford. Um, what you don't know is I'm also the Emergency Management Director for the town of New Canaan, where I live, my wife Sarah and our four daughters. Um, and in that resp responsibility, I also am responsible for looking over the school safety of our 3,000 children. As part of that job, I had the pleasure, or displeasure, depending on how you look at it, 
um, to attend an NYPD briefing, counterintelligence briefing, on the Las Vegas shooting in particular. We covered the Fort Lauderdale shooting, and we covered the Las Vegas shooting. I had the sheriff's office from uh, Las Vegas come in, and we, I got to witness, um, unfortunately, uh, the, all the footage captured by police body cameras, all the footage captured by surveillance cameras in the casino. I also viewed all the footage captured by Uber drivers waiting for the people at the show to let out. And what I saw, I had to sit through six minutes of 1,100 shots being fired. So to answer your question, the bump stock is not a recreational shooting device. It's something that is designed for mass killing. I do agree that this is a mental health issue, and we've got to put more money towards mental health. I do strongly support the Second Amendment, but there is no benefit to the bump stock for hunting. Thank you. Can I? Thank you. Do you wait, hold on, late your turn. Did you want to go, Mr. Mm-hmm. We'll get to you. <laughs> I am a physician, a physician in practice for almost 40 years now. And to me, the critical point on this discussion is mental health. Unless and until we have enough funding and we address mental health, all of these, what we see, the atrocities, whether in our own state and in other states across the nation, will continue. And what we try to do here is law-abiding citizens become felons, and those who don't abide by the law don't care about it anyway. So to me, I would always focus I would always concentrate as we move forward, how can we, how should we continue to address this big plague that we have, mental illness, an illness that you do not want to talk about, continues to stay in the closet, as opposed to other illnesses. If I, God forbid, I don't, if I have cancer, you are all going to empathize with me. You're going to be supporting me. Why not mental health? That's what we need to address. I just want to make sure we're doing the same thing that I did with Mr. Herbst over there. Would you support Representative Srinivasan or not a bump stock ban? I would not. I would support. I would support a bomb stop ban because the federal government is looking into it and we are I'm going to wait and see what the recommendations are going to be I believe in law of the land whether it be sanctuary cities which I will always oppose because that is the law of the land and the same thing here look at it at a national level see what the picture is and that's what I will be supporting moving forward believe in the Constitution, the second Constitution, and every, every, each and every part of what our Constitution stands for. Thank you. Apologize, Mr. Walker. No problem. I will protect and defend the Constitution of the United States, including the Second Amendment, as well as the Constitution of the State of Connecticut. Believe it or not, the Constitution of the State of Connecticut actually has stronger gun rights than the Constitution of the United States because it says you have a right to bear arms to protect yourself and your state. It says nothing about well-regulated anything. That does not mean that people have the right to own as much as they want, carry it wherever they want, and do whatever they want. Uh, the simple fact of the matter is we have a problem with background checks. Uh, there is a problem with bump stocks. It, it, it in effect, takes a, a – it's a device that, in effect, cr uh, will take a – convert a legal weapon into an illegal weapon. Therefore, if you look at it on a, on a substance over form analysis, you shouldn't allow that. Uh, but I also think that we have to recognize that we do have a mental health problem. Number one cause of gun violence in America is suicides. The, state, the city with the, with the toughest gun laws in America has the highest murder rate in America. It's Chicago. So let's protect and defend our constitutional rights. Let's close the loopholes. Let's deal with devices 
that take legal weapons and make them illegal. Let's deal with mental health and let's try to do what we can to protect our rights while assuring public safety. By the way, my wife is a substitute teacher. She was teaching in elementary school the day of the Newtown tragedy. So I'm very sympathetic to the issues there, but I also believe in the Constitution. Thank you. It is your turn, Mr. Lamage. Uh, it's interesting what they're telling you tonight that um, Dr. Prasad became a uh, Second Amendment guy all of a sudden, but he voted against your Second Amendment rights. Tim Herbst is telling you that he supports the Second Amendment. He's got derating from the NRA. Uh, my friend Dave Walker is telling you that there is no background checks in F for Second Amendment. I'm a licensed uh, carrier. I carry. And in order for me to obtain the permit to carry, the pistol permit, I had to go to Fairfield Police Department, complete a bunch of forms. I was fingerprinted. Eventually, I was sent to the state police paid another fee, and got my permit. They did a background investigation on me before they gave me a permit. Now, Second Amendment is a natural right. It is a God-given right. The Founding Fathers understood what it means to defend yourself, and the purpose of the Second Amendment is not hunting, is not sports, it is your ability as American citizens to defend yourselves against a tyrannical government. How do I know that? I studied that in law school. I'm an attorney. One of the reasons why I'm passionate about the Second Amendment is to do the fact where I came from. I came from Albania. We had no Second Amendment. The moment government agents showed up to take my family into a concentration camp, they were the only ones who had guns because we had no Second Amendment. They took my family into that concentration camp and my father never made it out of it because we couldn't defend ourselves. Do not let anyone mislead you that if they disagree with certain amendments of the Constitution, that they will uphold the rest of the Constitution. You either respect the Constitution or you don't. There are 4,440 words in that Constitution that the Founding Fathers gave us. And once you take an oath that you're going to serve the people of this state, you are supposed to take the entirety of that Constitution, respect it and uphold it and be proud of it. Thank you. Mr. Lamaz, just real quick, again, the bump stock, would you support a ban or no? Anything that restricts the law-abiding citizens of obtaining a permit to legally carry a gun to defend themselves and their families, their families I would oppose it. 99.9% .9 of the crimes in the United States are not committed by people who have, or individuals or citizens, who le obtain legal guns. They are committed by criminals. We don't go after criminals because we want to be politically correct, and that is destroying us. We have to go after criminals, not law-abiding citizens. Think about the sanctuary cities that Dr. Prasad was just mentioning. He was against it, now he's pro it, because he's running for governor. We have people who committed crimes, and because of our laws that we passed in Hartford, we're not cooperating with ICE, which is the federal law. So we're choosing to tell you, or some of them are choosing to tell you tonight, what do you want to hear, that they are pro-Second Amendment, pro the Constitution, pro-law and order. They are not. Look into them. Thank you. Now, your two names, Re Representative Srinivasan, your name was mentioned, and... He also mentioned Mr. Walker's name at the beginning of that. You have a 20-second rebuttal if you want and to mine. use that. And mine. He, did he mention? I didn't he hear that one. Name, okay. Yes. Got it. That's what you were saying. All right. So would you like a rebuttal? We'll go down the line. You have 20 seconds. Otherwise, it's going to eat into your time after that. <coughs> Madam moderator, I was mentioned twice. So do I get 40 seconds? I think you only get 20 <laughs> seconds. <laughs> All right. Nice I try. tried. I tried. Prasad, we can split the 40. <laughs> <laughs> We've got to look beyond what is just said today. And this reference that I suddenly am going back and forth because I'm running for governor. No. You've got to look at that bill. Time. That bill had mental health. That was the reason that bill was so important to all of us. Mental health. 
Thank you. Uh, I'd just like to make a, a note here uh, that the crowd can't see it, but I'd like all the candidates to take a look. We're running, starting to run low on time here, and please pay close attention. Some have run out of time, so I'd just like everybody under the rules to just uh, take a look at how much time you have or you don't have. And you will have a uh, one-minute rebuttal at the end, or not a rebuttal, correct. a uh, closing statement. Everybody, even if they've run out of time, will have one minute at the end. Would you like to use your 20-second rebuttal? Yeah, and you you mentioned go. my name, but yes. what, I what I recall him saying is I was a nice guy, and I totally agree <laughs> with him. Al although he implied, he implied if you had any restriction whatsoever that you were violating the Second Amendment. Look, I will protect and defend the Constitution, but unless and until the Supreme Court of the United States says that it's a violation of the Constitution, it's not. Thank you. All right? Appreciate it. I and Tim, I apologize. I have three hmm? minutes left. Oh, you have three minutes left. The 20 seconds. We well, thought that was on, under the rebuttal category. Yeah, we should Possibly. go longer. Yes, right. actually, yes. If you want to keep going, you're welcome to. Yeah. That was the 20 the, seconds. The last I thing I want to say is I will protect and defend the Constitution of the United States and Connecticut. That's a fact. I'm a member of the Sons of the American Revolution. My family came here in the 1680s. I know what the Constitution's about, and you won't have to worry about that with me. Thank you. Thank you. And Tim, you do get your rebuttal. The rating he referenced, I, was, I never filled out a questionnaire from the NRA. Fact. And the other thing, when we talk about politicians telling you things and not delivering, Peter is going around the state telling gun owners and law-abiding citizens that he's going to repeal 1160 entirely. And the media and everybody here needs to ask them this question. Where are the 76 votes in the House and the 19 votes in the Senate that he's going to produce to repeal 1160? I think that's 20 seconds. And now you get a rebuttal. I have the right to respond. Uh, if it, yeah, if it comes to my desk, I will repeal it. Because when they passed it, it didn't make any sense. That law would not have prevented the tragedy that happened that day. It is unfortunate but would not have done anything to prevent the tragedy. And Tony Boucher, for, you know, just to mention her name, she voted for that too. We got three Republicans here tonight who voted in favor of restricting your Second Amendment right. I'm concerned about it, because if they don't respect your Second Amendment, who assures you that they are going to respect your uh, First Amendment or Fourth Amendment or Fifth Amendment? I think, I still believe, you either take the Constitution in its entirety and you respect it and you abide by it, or you don't believe in the Constitution and become a Democrat. Most of them are, by the way. I just want to make sure I'm clear. Who's out of time right now? Representative Srinivasan and Tim... And Tim Herbst. It's just how many people? And Peter Lamage is out of time, too. So okay. when you ask a follow-up, okay. that counts against our time. Because you asked me two questions on guns, not one. Well, I mean, if you're going to be that much of a stickler, but you've got to answer the question. All right, Steve... I think Steve Oxenich has not answered yet. ...has not answered has not the gun yet, question. Correct? So, come on up, if you want to. <laughs> Finally got back into this. Twice in my life, I took an oath to support and defend the Constitution of the United States. The first was on induction day at the Naval Academy as a midshipman. The second was when I became an officer in the Navy. And I've always taken that oath very th seriously. So I'm a military veteran. I'm trained in firearms. I'm not afraid of firearms when handled correctly. I've gone through NRA training. It's pretty rigorous if you've never gone through it. So that's my experience. And I also know that there are criminals, terrorists, and people who do have mental challenges out there and most recently, this last budget, over the last few years, when the legislature and Governor Malloy put a budget in place, the first thing that's gut, that gets gutted is mental health. So are we going to stand up and address this problem or not? Because right now, we're not doing a lot if we want to prevent the tragedy that happened in Newtown around what that man did. So I am for common sense gun laws. And I think we have to look at a spectrum on a lot of issues about how we preserve an individual's right, and I believe that law-abiding citizens have a right to own a gun. And on the other spectrum, it's about public safety. 
And it's that discussion where we have to be of how do we preserve a right and public safety. So when it comes to things like bump stocks, I need to look at it a little more longer. I don't have a direct answer today for you, and I want to see what happens at the federal government. But I will vigorously control, uh, really enforce the Constitution of the United States because that's an oath I've taken twice in my life and something I take very seriously. So thank you. Thank you. All right, we have... Oh, yep, Tom. Go ahead. Since my name was mentioned, I do have my NRA gun safety permit and certificate because you have to know a little bit about what you're regulating. You can support strongly the Second Amendment while still having common sense regulation. The question is how far do you go? And I think in Connecticut we've gone too far. Every session gives you an opportunity to change that and I propose a lot of amendments that would help to mitigate some of the overreach. Okay, I think we, uh, it looks like, uh, just to help the audience, it looks like this will be the final question. Um, then everybody has a minute closing statement. Uh, from what I'm seeing from the timekeepers, just so the rest of the crowd will know, it looks like that Prasad, Mr. Lumage, and Tim Herbst have all run out of time. The others still have time that you might not be able to see, and I think this question goes to Tony Boucher. Yes, I didn't ask it yet, so uh, I'll ask it. Uh, we have heard years and years of criticism of Governor Dan Malloy, and we know the views of him of everybody on this stage. In light of the problems with the pension underfunding that lasted for many years, how would you assess the record of Malloy's predecessor, Jody Rell? I'm happy to answer that. I hope I get my 20 seconds back. Uh, quite honestly, Jody Rell was faced with a supermajority House and Senate. There were many budgets that she tried to pass but could not do that. And so she was under a very different political environment. Personally, I probably would have been a lot tougher being in her position. Absolutely, because we absolutely do need to address it. This governor had the greatest opportunity of all time being in one political party with the House and Senate as far as in the same political party, and all of the contracts were coming due this year. You can make wholesale reform, and they didn't do it. They played to the special interests, protected them at the expense of every taxpayer in the state, our schools and our towns. All right, right on time. Mr. Handler is next. Thank you. I thought for a second we might spend more time talking about casinos um, than we were going to talk about uh, the major issues facing our state. Listen, there's no question about it that Governor Malloy inherited a tough hand. Um, these pension liabilities, these unfunded retiree health care benefits, this didn't happen overnight. But let's be fair. They got worse every single day that the governor was in office for the last seven years. I know because I just cleaned up the very same mess in the city of Stanford. And I think what we should be talking about is what the solutions are, not just blame. We've got to bend the curve of these structured costs, and we've got to do it now. And the only way we can do that is to get pri public sector benefits to look more like the private sector benefits, like those of all of you out there. The only way we can do that, three tools. We can legislate it, and I would implore the legislature today to start tonight, go back and start working on legislation that will remove collective bargaining rights for benefits. Take benefits away from the collective bargaining arena and move it to the legislative arena. Step one. Number two, we've got a legal challenge. I would also ask the legislature to work with attorneys to figure out what the best argument we make for the inability to pay for these benefits. And we should start making that right now today. But that alone is not going to solve the problem. The last tool we have at our disposal is the one we need to use. And it's the one I've got experience in the city of Stanford with. It's negotiation. I inherited 10 bargaining units in the city of Stanford. We negotiated the benefits to look more like the private sector benefits, but not by hitting them with a hammer, not by arguing or talking over people, but by listening and by educating and by talking to people about what the true definition of the word unsustainable means for you and your families. And once we got through that definition, we started to make real substantive progress on benefits that we can afford, that is fair to employees and is fair to the taxpayers. And then we back that up with our commitment to fully fund all of those benefits. And today, Stanford is the only city, a triple-A city, 
who fully funds 100% of the long-term contributions required for both pension and retiree health. And that's what we should be talking about as a state. That's what we have to do, and we have to do it now. Nothing else is going to matter unless we resolve this issue. The number one financial challenge facing this state is $71 billion in unfunded pension and retiree health care benefits. Based upon reasonable assumptions, pensions are funded at 25 cents on the dollar. Retiree health care is funded one to two cents on the dollar. It is 70 to 80 percent of our financial problem. You cannot restore the competitive posture of this state. You cannot assure fiscal sustainability of this state unless you deal with that. Number two, this state has the highest excess compensation or compensation premium as compared to the private sector for people with comparable skills and knowledge of any state in the union. It's not because we pay employees too much in cash compensation. We don't. In many cases, we should pay them more based on skills, knowledge, and performance. But we way overpay on pensions and even more overpay on health care and retiree health care. I am uniquely positioned to solve this problem. I have run two of the three federal agencies that oversee private pension and employee benefit plans. I have run a worldwide consulting operation that deals with for government, private sector, and the not-for-profit sector, and I've worked with governors and others who have actually tackled this problem in other states. Let's do not kid ourselves. You are not going to be able to bargain these changes. We're going to have to legislatively override the CBAC agreement. We're going to have to legislatively uh, rescind the anti-layoff provision because government's grown too big, promised too much. It's got to be restructured. In addition to that, we're going to have to legislatively uh, state what our pension and health care benefits are so that they are as good or better than a Fortune 100 company, but we can afford it and sustain it. I want to do that. We can do it under the sovereign powers of this state. It's been done elsewhere. It can be, do, be done here. I'm committed to do it. And then I want to implement a mini version of the Employee Retirement Income Security Act that for state workers, they'll know what the rules are about what we can do in the future. We'll have a firm commitment to fund, and we can have much tougher conflict of interest rules with regard to asset management because there are all kinds of conflicts going on in our asset management. Thank you. Thank you. Did, did he mention your name? Yep. I'm sorry, say that again? You didn't. She pointed. Okay. I, I believe that um, Mike Handler pointed to me uh, in saying that we needed to uh, pass certain bills, and I wanted to respond to his. I didn't see that. I didn't see that. Um, all right, uh, 20 seconds, and then, and then Mr. Obsitnik goes, okay, I, I, we missed that one. <laughs> you did. You did. I was about Thank to say, you. you have a nice... Thank you, Mike. Mike is a constituent. He's a, he's a great guy. Uh, listen, you know, we have indeed done that. We have proposed propo bill after bill to reform the pension system up in Hartford. We've been in the trenches. We've been fighting uphill for a number of years. The problem is we don't have the votes to pass it through committee. That's what has to change. Thank you. Thank you. All right. All right. It I think Steve is answering this, the main question. Is that right? Will you, you, will you reference two? It is nonpartisan. Why don't we just Hold on one second. After that? It is nonpartisan that our career politicians have taken us down this road to ruin. It started with Weicker, who put in the temporary income tax. It didn't put in the spending cap. And then John Rowland put in the 20-year deal to maybe secure an election. And then Dan Malloy did it another 17 years. So it is nonpartisan that our governors have not served us well, period. So what do we got to do about it? I have operated business and negotiated deals around this world. There's something that many of us in this room probably deal with. It's called a 401k. It has brought solvency to nonprofits, for-profits, and it's got to come to the state of Connecticut for every employee that works there. But the reality of our pension problem right now is this last budget, we balanced it on the back of teachers because teachers' pensions are set by the legislature. 
So they could balance it on teachers. And teachers pay 7% now or so into their pension, and the national average is about 6.9%. State employee workers, the national average is 69 And a Connecticut state employee worker spends 2.2% into theirs, a third of what a teacher does. So we've got to address this head on. The overall unfunded liability, the health care costs that we're addressed with, and we have to do it in a way that looks at current retirees and say, you know what, you worked your butt off, you have an obligation, that's not your problem. Current person out there, join the state of Connecticut, time for a defined contribution, and then we have to sit down with unions, talk to them, and if that doesn't work, go through the legislative process, and finally, we're a sovereign entity. I will not allow this state to default on any obligations. It's time for us to rise up and take control of our state again. Thank you. This is a 20 second rebuttal, I believe. I was referenced as a legislator and that's why I'm rebutting here. In this legislative session, we saw the CBAC agreement tying down for 10 years, two and a half governors, five legislative sessions, we all opposed that. Republicans opposed that CBAC agreement. Thank you. All right. Who has some time left here? We have two minutes for Mike. Anybody else? Everyone else has their time. You have 10 seconds. Okay. 10 seconds. 10 seconds. What would you like to say? <laughs> you want to share, Mike? What we're going to do is we are going to add it to your closing remarks. Does that work for you all? Get, you'll get a minute 10, you'll get three minutes. All right, so just while we're starting to stretch the rules a little bit, it's time for closing remarks, which is a good thing. Right. Uh, and we're going to start on this end, right? Correct. We start at the end, Senator and Senator Boucher. Boucher is first, and then we will uh, swing back. In my exploration for statewide office, two things come to mind. Number one, when your financial house is in order, you better get ready to, see, to do that turnaround immediately. You don't have two or three years to learn the ropes. Number two, we are a deep blue state. Two to one, registered Democrat. We better have someone that's exploring or a candidate that resonate the other side of the aisle. I received this letter from someone uh, in, during my exploratory, I'm going to read it to you because it blew me away when I received it. Dear Tony, it's come to my attention that you are possibly considering a run for the office of governor. I hope you do it. As a member of the other party, there comes a time to put partisan politics aside and do the right thing. Connecticut needs you to set us back on the right track. You have my complete support should you run. In many ways, you remind me of Ella Grasso. I truly felt she was one of the very best governors this state has ever seen. Just remember, in the end, you'll be judged by your integrity, dedication, commitment, and courage. I believe you have all four. Thanks for all you do. I know at times like this, it seems like a thankless job, but there's no doubt you've always tried to do what's best for your district and the state. All the best, Dr. Margaret Reed. Boy, that really touched me deeply. And it's made me Thank more you, disappointed. Senator. Thank you. These are one minute closing remarks, just as a reminder. Thank you. Go, Go right ahead. I'm not going to start it yet. You've heard me talk about proven reformers and Har sending Hartford outsiders to clean up the mess under the dome. But I believe leaders lead by example. And I'm the only candidate on the stage tonight that has signed a lead by example pledge. And I've said I'm going to do as governor what I did in Trumbull. I'm going to refuse a pension from the state of Connecticut. I'm going to insist that all of my department heads, agency heads do the same. I'm going to insist that a part-time citizen legislature no longer receive a pension benefit. And I'm the only person on this stage who is committed to not accepting donations from Hartford lobbyists. Because if we're going to change the culture in Hartford, we have to lead by example. And if we're going to lead by example and change the culture, we have to win. And we have to nominate candidates that have been battle-tested and battle-ready. I had the honor and privilege of being your candidate for state treasurer for you, back in 2014, taking on a very popular 16-year incumbent and coming within less than 
I've beat a Democratic incumbent in Trumbull. I was the first Republican first Thank you, Mr. reelected in 40 years. We need to win to fix our state. You have a minute 10. For 30 years, we've been going down this road to ruin, led there by career politicians that care more about the status quo than breaking us out of this downward spiral. So how's it working? Falling wages, falling home prices, the exodus of 100 people who have to move out of Connecticut each and every day to find opportunities somewhere else is just wrong. I don't think anyone in this room thinks we're on a sustainable path. And my path will be different. I'm a military veteran who served here in Connecticut. I've created good, high-tech jobs that we need here in Connecticut now more than ever, and I know it takes for ideas, companies, and states to effectively compete today. More importantly, I'm from Connecticut. I grew up in Stanford. I lived in Enfield. I lived in Groton. And now I live in Westport where I'm raising my family with my wife and my two daughters. So you know what? I care about Connecticut. I care about you. I care about your family. And what I will do, I will fight every day tirelessly to ensure that Connecticut is a place where you can raise your family, grow a business, earn a living wage, and hopefully retire with dignity. That's what I want for Connecticut. My name is Steve Upsitnik. I look forward to earning your vote over the next year. Thank you. Mr. Lumash. Thank you. Uh, since 2014 to present, I never stopped helping Republicans any time that they ran for an office donated to them, when door knocking with them. But what we did most importantly is this. We have registered so far almost five, uh, 50,000 people in our state who never voted Republican before, who are willing to vote Republican and support me if I get your nomination. That number is going to make all the difference. It is the inner cities, which the Republican Party completely ignored, various ethnic groups who never voted Republican before, and what we did, we went to those cities, we went to these ethnic groups, we're converting them into Republicans. That is the strategy for us to win in 2018. Dan Drew sent an email, and by mistake, he sent it to our campaign too. What he said is that we have to defeat Peter Lumage, who has raised over $400,000 so Thank far you, for the Lamage. campaign. And he's right. He should fear me because I'm the one who's going to defeat him. Thank you very much and have a great night. My wife, Mary, and I chose Connecticut eight years ago. We love the state and plan to retire here. We have decided to fight rather than flee. But let me say, you need to consider two things. Number one, who can win? I'm a Reagan, Bush 41, and Clinton presidential appointee confirmed by the Senate three times unanimously when the Democrats controlled it twice, the Republicans once. I have Republicans, Democrats, and independents holding fundraisers for me, some Democrats that have never voted for a Republican in their life because they love the state, they know it's in trouble, and they want somebody to solve the problem. I'm the only candidate on this stage, or frankly ones that aren't on this stage who are running on either side, who's actually made government smaller, more economical, more efficient, more effective, and improved the financial condition of the entity that I was responsible for when I was the leader. I can do it. I've done it. You need a proven leader to save this state. But it's not just the governor. Thank we you, need Mr. the Walker. Senate and the House. We need a team. Let's turn around Connecticut. I want to thank everybody this evening for being here and supporting all of us. You heard differences among all of us. And the important thing we've got to remember is Connecticut is not only a two or three state, it has an area called 860, is another area code where I come from. And that is critical in this election moving forward. I am not your stereotype Republican. Look at, it, look at all of us here. You need a message. You need a messenger. The message has to resonate not just with the Republicans. It didn't get us far in the last two election cycles for governor. 
you need a candidate whose message will resonate with the independents. 60 percent, 50 to 60 percent of the state are independents and bring over the crossover Democrats. That candidate is me. Give me your voice. Give me your choice. And I'll be your candidate, your voice. Thank you. You have three minutes, Mr. Handler. Thank you. First, Jen, Chris, thank you both for moderating tonight. Um, thank you all for being a wonderful audience. Um, listen, we all know what's at stake. We've got a lot riding in this election in 2018. If we don't make serious, substantive change, things are not going to be the way Connecticut deserves it to be. Sarah and I have four daughters. We refuse to live in a state where our daughters are going to grow up and go off and explore the world in college and not be able to come back to our state and raise our grandchildren around us. I do not want to be that grandfather who's on a plane to go visit my grandchildren. But we're not going to get there with platitudes and, and promises. We're not going to get there with IOUs. We won't get there with token givebacks. We need to make substantive change, and we need to make it now. We need to bend the curve of our fixed structural costs until we can afford to live in our homes. We're looking at real property value devaluation if we are not careful here. We saw it in the governor's first proposal for the budget. We know what a third of the unfunded teacher pensions pushed onto our towns does to all of our home values. We cannot afford that to happen. We do not have a revenue problem. We have a spending problem, and we must address it now. My mission is to travel around the state and not talk about the blame and the problems. It's to talk about the solutions. We need to fix our structured liabilities. It's not sexy. No one wants to talk about it. But these pensions and these unfunded retiree health benefits are crowding out everything else we want to do in the state. The saddest thing about tonight's debate, we didn't spend one minute talking about education, something that is probably more important to all of you than any casino in the world. We have got to get back to doing good things in our state. We cannot do it in financial crisis. I thank you for your support. I look forward to seeing you again. Thank you. Have a good night. All right. Thank you, everyone. We wanted, JR, yeah. we wanted to thank the audience. This was a very good audience. Yes, uh, you guys were excellent. No disruptions, no problems. Uh, we think everyone got a fair shake. We wanted to thank the candidates. And, uh, thank you, Time everyone, everyone used up their time. Be before we go, if we could just give a round of applause for these candidates who have stood up here tonight for two hours. This is not easy. And I have to tell you, before you leave tonight, understand this. That if we're going to save this state, it's going to take the people in this room. It's going to take your energy, your effort, your donations, your support, your phone banking. We cannot save the state without you. So if any of these candidates inspired you, get involved and help them take and fix, and fix this state. Thank you. Enjoy the rest of your night. Thank you so much for coming.